better run, man Life's a pain, but you got me Yeah, life's a pain, but I got you Hey Parasites, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog And today, we're gonna check out a few comic books to catch us up to all the stuff that will lead to the prelude of Venom War, which is starting very soon. I think Venom number 35, which comes out in a couple weeks, I think that'll be like the precursor to Venom War, and then they're going to go right into the miniseries along with all the tie-ins. And I don't know if I'll cover every single thing as they come out, because uh, as you know, I recently got rid of my Venom collection, so buying physical stuff again is, you know, something I really didn't want to do. So maybe I'll buy them digitally as they come out. And uh, and then once they do, maybe I'll do like little one minute reviews on the shorts and we'll get like little reviews out there uh, without spoilers. And then once the whole Venom War is done, we'll do like a long you know episode and I'll have other guests on maybe and we'll dissect the whole book, um, you know, in totality like that. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But for now, I just want to talk about Carnage number eight, which is the final issue of Carnage. We got Venom issues 33 and 34, which are the Blood Hunt tie ins. And then we have the free comic book day issue, which now I see looks like it takes place after issue 34 of Venom. So we're going to dive in. So let's get to it. The first book we're going to talk about is Carnage. And this is called The Ship in the River. Like I said, it's the final issue of Carnage. And the reason for that is because I think they're going to just turn Carnage into a miniseries that takes place during Venom War. So I don't know if that was always the plan um, or if sales dictated that or whatever. But at least whatever the story they're trying to build up here with Cletus, it looks like they're going to wrap it up probably during the Venom War storyline, which is fine. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, I have not really been digging this run. The first couple issues, I was like, ah, all right, I kind of see where they're going. Let's see what happens. And then they did the Dylan crossover, which I thought was just a complete waste. And then we have this issue, which I don't know. It's, I wouldn't say it's a, a waste or anything. It just feels like what Torin started on this book, which was like the serial killer aspect and everything. It's like she's trying to go back to that, but then also have these character moments with Flash and Liz, which is fine. I like character moments, but it just, it's like, why go back to that when you already had this momentum of going forward? But I guess the reason and the story point of why that happens is because Flash used that super weapon, right? And the last issue. So we got art by Perry Perez here, um, and then we got the final shot from the last issue where Carnage gets a whole blast right through him from this new weapon. And then now we have Flash learning that Liz... Uh, it has a symbiote. And so that's pretty much the whole story in this book is that it's Flash and Liz getting reacquainted and him learning about her symbiote and wondering where that weapon came from and who designed it and, you know, and everything. And then also going to Cletus or Carnage and him slowly rebuilding himself back into a, a new body because that weapon really did hurt him. It did cause a lot of damage. And so he has to rebuild himself while also the parallel of Flash rebuilding himself. So that was one thing in this issue that I kind of liked. I'm like, all right, I see what Torin's going for here, but I just felt like this book a little bit to me was just all over the map. But these little moments here, I really like, and I think Torin does a really good job writing them, where you have Flash going, okay, I'm going to shave my beard. I'm going to try to, you know, rebuild my life. Now that I'm back, I'm going to start mingling with people, making friends. You know, he goes to meetings with other people who are struggling with alcoholism and everything. And, you know, they're tying back into that, which I'm like, good, because... When the book started, I think he was back in a bar and stuff. I don't think he was drinking alcohol fully, but, um, you know, I know that's something that Flash always wrestles with. And there was a time where one of the books recently I talked about where they had him in a bar drinking. It might have even been Carnage, where I was like, ah, if that's alcohol, that's not, that's so out of character uh, for Flash, you know, after all he's been through. But it looks like Torin is really, uh, you know, leaning the other way with that and showing that he is recovering and that even at a point where he's sitting at the bar, there's a girl, the bartender that he has a crush on, she comes over and gives him a mocktail instead of a cocktail. So she makes up her own version where there's no alcohol in it and gives it to Flash. So, you know, and they kind of flirt with each other. And so it's building his life, you know, him getting back on his feet while also paralleling Carnage, eating people and rebuilding himself. <laughs> so I won't spoil everything. Like I said, I don't want to get into that kind of stuff with the uh, newer comics. I don't want to give away the full issue, you know, especially when I'm flipping through it like this. So I will say if you have been enjoying the Carnage series, pick this one up because it does conclude at least this arc for the most part. Um, there's a little bit at the end where Torin is making a comment about social media and how people can be sheep and just follow things. And, and some of the characters that we saw in the early issues, like news reporters and stuff, come back and play a part in that temporarily uh, and without spoiling anything. And, uh, and then kind of chaos happens and it kind of sets it up for Venom War and Flash being there at 
ground zero, I guess, for this moment of Cletus Cassidy. So we'll see where this story goes. I think Flash is going to be in a different book with Black Widow when the Venom War starts, but hopefully he still plays a part in the Carnage book. Uh, you know, who knows? We'll see. Um, but yeah, so pick up issue eight. I don't have a digital code for this one. There wasn't one in the book, but uh, I will have some digital codes for these other issues as we discuss those. Venom 33 and 34 are both tying into the Blood Hunt miniseries that's going out right now, which is Jed McKay's book, which has vampires taking over the world. And this is no different. We have reanimated corpses and vampires and stuff from different eras uh, coming back. There's even a great point at the beginning where there's someone from like the 1730s and a pilot from the 1930s, uh, and they're all they're flying a plane together, and they're dropping this character here, known as the Captive, who is, as we learn, this is Al Ewing writing this, and Juan Ferreira, who does a great job on, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, Juan, but your art is amazing on this book. Uh, it's really, really cool. It's, it's when you draw Venom, especially corpse zombie out Venom, it's really, really neat. But you have these vampires that are dropping this thing that was taken by their kind many, many, many years ago. It was frozen on ice and has been kept alive all this time and apparently will feed on pretty much anything. And so the vampires are like, should we release it? And they're like, well, the heroes could outnumber us and overcome us at one point. It would be nice if something like this got out there, especially with symbiotes out there because they recently tried to take over the world in King and Black, so we should annihilate them too because they're not vampires. So they drop this creature that they've had in captivity all this time and his name is the Captive. And what we learn is that he's part of a race that once enslaved the symbiotes, the Clintar, uh, according to this lore here that they add into the book. But that's kind of neat because, you know, obviously Donny Cates, he introduced that whole theme of cages with the Clintar race and how they've been caged and stuff. And so that's what the Captive says. He's like, you know, did you ever wonder who put you in those cages? And that's what he's claiming, at least, is that the Captive race was one that did that and at one point enslaved the symbiotes. But I guess the symbiotes fought back because as you're going to learn throughout these issues, uh, Venom itself, the symbiote, which is going around without a host right now because Dylan, he thinks is dead. Eddie, he doesn't know where Eddie in time is, so he can't connect to Eddie. And he's kind of looking for a host, but he doesn't want to just take a random person and possibly then be a bad host and, you know, and everything. So he's dying. The symbiote itself is dying. And so, uh, but it's also has this sudden urge to go see Lee Price and it doesn't understand why it's like well Lee was the last person we bonded with besides Peter Parker and Peter Parker's not going to take us back or so Venom thinks <laughs> you know he goes but uh but you know Lee Price did take us in and even though he corrupted us maybe there's a chance we can you know go and see him see his body and and you know who knows what we can do I don't know if we can reanimate him he's been dead too long Carnage ripped his you know codex out and his heart out so, uh, you know, disguise as Eddie. Um, and so I don't know what, what we'll be able to do. So we're going to try. And meanwhile, while he's going off to look for Lee Price's grave, you have Dylan here who's being brought to this warehouse under the city. And uh, and he's teaming up with Toxin. But then Toxin learns that the blood hunt is happening. So he's like, okay, I got to get back and try to save my dad, make sure he's okay. So you should be fine here. So it's a really cool little issue here. Um, and like I said, you get moments like this where the art is amazing. And you have Venom, or the symbiote at least, back at the you know graveyard where Lee Price is. And that's where he meets the captive. And that's where he notices that Lee Price's body is missing. And that Lee has been reanimated into a zombieote. Because there was still somehow a little bit of symbiote left in Lee's body. So when he gets reanimated and becomes undead, there's still a symbiote attachment to him. And it's not a full symbiote. And it's one that the Venom suit recognizes. And is like, hey, that's kind of a part of us. I guess the mania symbiote codex got fully ripped out of lee but maybe a part still remained either of mania or of the original venom but whatever it is it's a zombieote. we got our zombieote here and this is going to lead into a mini series of zombieote stories that are going to happen in venom war so anyway those two meet they fight and then that's when they realize that the captive is here and he is and there's the digital code boom right on the screen there because i pulled it off already there the captive shows up and admits that he lured the symbiote here using his mind and that's how they were able to take control of the symbiotes and enslave them before was through minor mind control and he put suggestions in the symbiote's head to come look for lee price and that's where the captive was waiting with the reanimated zombieote and so the captive here is kind of a, a vampire-esque creature too you know it absorbs life from eating symbiotes and other things so 
it's or, or it's been you know turned into a vampire again it's it was locked in a crate all this time so i don't know if this is its original form or if it was something that was turned by the vampires and is now in control uh or is being controlled by vampires in a way but either way cool face off and cool introduction of this neat character that ties back to symbiote and clintar lore so that does conclude in this issue here 34 where the captive and venom just go on a full-on fight and the book starts off where the last one left off which is with dylan and he's face to face with this vampire priest and we learn that it's the same priest that the venom symbiote tried to kill in issue 150 of venom way back in the mike costa run way back when we started this channel so i thought that was a cool callback because i was critical of that i was like why is he trying to kill this priest after eddie opened up to the priest and everything and the symbiote you know suspected the priest might turn him in so it, you know, strangled the, the priest and everything. And luckily the priest didn't die. And the symbiote did try to come back later to heal him a little bit, uh, which they go over in this and they talk about how the priest talked to Eddie. Then the suit showed up and tried to kill him. And then it left him for dead in the hospital. Then it came back to try to heal him. And then after that, he left the hospital and was turned into a vampire soon after. So it shows him out in the streets uh, being hunted down by, you know, vampires. This is back when they were growing their army. So it's showing that secretly vampires have been plotting this for a while and they turn this priest you know just randomly so it's just a coincidence that he's the same priest that knows the symbiote but he comes to dylan going where's your father you know um i feel like i owe him and the symbiote some payback and so dylan has to fight him without access to his symbiote because obviously he kind of died and his soul slightly went over to the other side but didn't and then the hand of venom fate brought him back <laughs> you know so uh so all that is you know kind of touched on in this issue and they go over it to it in more detail but to avoid total spoilers um that cuts back back and forth between this fight with the captive and lee price and the venom symbiote and the venom symbiote is on its last leg it's melting it's dying it has no host it hasn't had one in a while so it's losing this fight and then the captive starts to reveal a weakness of itself that Venom realizes it can possibly exploit. And then Lee also chimes in and fights back against the captive, his mind control over, you know, the captive has mind control over Lee, but he fights back against it and knocks him out. Uh, and then he's like, wait, how are you fighting against me? I don't understand this. And then that's when they bond, boom, Venom rebonds with Lee Price and forms a zombie out super creature and they fight back. And it's pretty cool because that ties into how the Clintar race might have fought back against the original captives way back when but uh yeah i thought that was neat i don't want to show the ending of this book but it does involve a super eddie brock you know obviously we're building the venom war so you know your chances are you're going to see the main villain um he pops up at the end of the book and there's some dialogue there about where issue 35 might go and where venom war might go so yeah pick up issue 33 and 34 venom they're out right now you can get them digitally or at your local comic shop but they tie into Blood Hunt and they also tell their very own self-contained Venom story at the same time, which I really dug. And last but not least, we got to get to the free comic book day issue, which I talked about a while ago that we were going to discuss, but we never did because I was having trouble figuring out where it takes place in the story. And after reading 33 and 34, it looks like it takes place right after issue 34 because we have Dylan here uh, just a few days from now, it says Dylan Brock. And he's in that underground warehouse, just like the windows look similar. So this is him. And I'm guessing it's after he dispatches the priest who was trying to kill him. And that's when he gets another vision of the hand showing up and uh, the eventuality, I guess. And the two of them talk. And he says, look, there's a weapon that you're going to use to fight your father, but you don't know what it is yet. And he's like, well, if I don't know what it is yet, then how am I going to beat him? Like, you know, how will I know when I see the weapon? And that's when the eventuality says, yeah, that's okay. I I'm going to give you a little help. And then boom, Dylan Brock from the future shows up and he has a giant gun, which I think I saw the theory on, I don't know if it was Bizarnage or someone on Twitter had the theory that this gun is the same gun Flash uses against Carnage in issue seven and eight, but this is it in the future when it's perfected. And so this is like what Alchemex will create in the future with that technology and Dylan taking it and coming back in time to use it to help fight the symbiotes. So it looks like we have a cable version of Dylan who's now time traveled back to the present, which, uh, you know, I guess could happen because time is discombobulated now. So I guess this could happen, uh, but it's just really neat that they're going this route. He shows up with a big gun, just full on cable mode, but it's a version of Dylan who is ready to help 
past Dylan fight his father. And it says to be continued in Venom War number one. This has been really fun. And I actually, besides the Carnage issue, I enjoyed these three very much. And I'm looking forward to Venom War for sure. And that was something I didn't think I would say because at the beginning of this run, I was kind of 50-50 and I wasn't sure what they were building to. But now that I do know what they're building to, more, I would say I'm more interested. When they first announced Venom War, I was kind of meh about. But as more details come out and more storylines come out, I'm more excited. So let me know if you feel the same or if you feel different down below. And we'll keep talking as always down there. Thanks so much for watching the show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you in the future. Peace.